Hello fellow stargazers, Brian Coulter here, evolutionary astrologer, for your horoscope report for the upcoming Pisces full moon that happens on September 20th. Now before I get really granular with this uh, Pisces full moon, let's set the table and talk big picture for a moment. We got the three big events of this year, the Saturn Uranus square, the Pluto Eris square, and in the backdrop sort of informing these events, we have the nodes of the moon in Sagittarius and Gemini. And I've talked extensively about all these events, but let's reintroduce them because it's so important to talk about these things because it, it's really the big picture evolutionary intention for the collective this year as we're in this very pivotal point in human history. So broad strokes theme of Saturn Uranus square is the friction between the themes of Saturn, which is restriction, the rules of the past, regulations, top-down order, this sort of thing. And then Uranus is freedom. So restriction versus freedom. Uranus is about evolving into a new future. And this is the representative, really, of Aquarius, and we're entering this Aquarian age. We're trying to uh, awaken and go to a whole new level. And Saturn doesn't really like great change sometimes, negative side Saturn, and it can resist change kicking and screaming, and Uranus says we need some change. You know, Saturn represents the habits of the past, which Uranus is inviting us to outgrow. And we're going through tremendous growing pains now as we try to uh, outgrow those habits. Inwardly, the wisdom's rising up. We're, ma we're maturing. Outwardly, we're still coming from this habitual place. And we start to realize that we're not this way anymore. Yet we're still acting out of habit. So this does create a growing pains kind of process within the collective psyche. And the, the high-end expression of Saturn from the evolutionary lens, it represents the hard work we have to do, the great work of the collective, which is to be Uranus right now, Aquarius right now, which is to individuate, to become a truer versions of who we really are, instead of just a repeat of the habits of the past. And the more we find that, the more we find freedom within ourselves, and we find more freedom in our life. And some people call Uranus, even Aquarius too, the sign uh, Uranus rules, the awakener. You know, this reminds me of uh, many years ago, I met I met a, a woman, uh, I'll put in air quotes, by chance. You know, it happened very synchronistically. And this was during my Saturn return, actually. So there's Saturn energy in that part of my life too. And, uh, you know, we all have our Saturn return around 29 years old. So it's a very important part of our life. And at that point, I was really suffering uh, from depression. I didn't have much meaning in my life and addiction, too. Uh, I was feeling a bit hopeless. And I just picture God looking down at me, just shaking his head like, you know, I got to send him some help, you know. <laughs> and I met this girl, you know. I remember it I met her on Christmas, actually, whatever year that was. And um, she whirlwinded into my life. She acted as a very strong catalyst for my awakening. I always felt like I woke up from a long stupor at that point in my life, thanks to her, just by the natural energy she carried. And then three or four months later, she whirlwinded out of my life. And it had three fundamental qualities, that relationship. A sense of familiarity. I feel like I've known you before. A sense of urgency, coming together quickly. And brevity. It dissipated quickly, too. It was a very karmic sort of experience, which, by the way, if you have relationships in your life that are like that, it's very much a, fil a fifth house sort of relationship, the house of romance and courtship and love affairs. And from the evolutionary astrology perspective, we look at it always more karmically. A fifth house type relationship is where souls agree to come together in a certain lifetime to resolve the karmic charge between them, and it dissipates. So it did have that very fifth house feeling, and I do have a lot of planets in my fifth house, so that fits. So she woke me up. She asked, acted as a catalyst, and I've always called her the, you know, the awakener in my life. I always think back to that period of my life, and I, and I thank her, even though she's not in my life anymore. And I called her the awakener, awakener way before I knew about astrology. And as it turns out, her son's in Aquarius. She has a strong Uranus in her chart to boot. So I'm saying all this as a useful metaphor for the process we're going through really as humanity as we're going through this process of awakening. 
But in order to awaken, it's got to get worse before it gets better. And we're feeling the worst of it now. And it's through the very Saturnian hardship that more and more, more people are waking up as they see the total insanity in front of them. Meanwhile, you got the nodes of the moon and Pluto and Eris and all that stuff I haven't talked about yet. But, you know, South Node Sagittarius is people are fanatical about their belief systems. And one set of belief systems fighting another set of belief systems, fueled by this, uh, this very uh, potent, almost visceral energy of, of Pluto square Eris is really highlighting the survival instincts in everybody highlighting the survival of the fittest or dog-eat-dog world, which is coming out uh, in uh, this very negative Saturnian sort of uh, point of view, which is life's a bitch and then you die. So I'm going to make the most of it now. So we're seeing it in materialism in all kinds of ways, in greed, taking advantage of people because of these toxic, blinded belief systems. What's the high end of Pluto? What are we trying to achieve with the Pluto era square? Well, manifest the higher level of competition towards what? Towards Uranian goals, towards the evolution of society and towards humanity. And this is deeply connected, I think, to uh, technology, very lofty technology that's going to continue to come out over the next decade. I'm very excited about that. In fact, it's already been invented, like free energy technology. That's been proven by the work of... Um, Oh, I forget his name. But he, he made the, the movie, um, Foster Gamble's his name. He made the movie Thrive 2, where he proved that there's this young boy from Africa that invented a free energy device. And actually, there's been documented many uh, people that have created free energy devices, but they've been, what? They've been suppressed. Why? Because they don't make any money. You know, there's the dark side of Pluto. Meanwhile, meanwhile the, the high side of Pluto the proliferation of this free energy device to, to bring us into this more evolved expression of humanity within the Aquarian age, which is very technological, technologically advanced. Now, in the last video, I talked about it being a period of preparation before we enter the storm, the calm before the storm, if you will. And now, during this lunation cycle, the last half of September, we've gotten closer to the storm. We can see it. We can see the lightning bolts. The rain is starting to drizzle on our face. So it's getting a bit stormier, the astrological weather is. And that storm is only going to grow stronger over the coming months where it will hit its apex, its crescendo of energy at the very end of the year, right around Christmas, when we have this third and final Saturn-Uranus square, where the energy is at peak maximum. So we're building up to being in the middle of the storm, and now we're starting to feel the storm. And there's a variety of reasons for that. Uh, one is, is we have uh, Venus in Scorpio, a sign about uh, basically emotional processing. Here it is, uh, Venus, the relationship planet, the evolutionary intention of this planet going through this sign, especially if it's entering a very sensitive place of your own birth chart. You always need to use your birth chart as context. But the evolutionary intention is to develop skills at shadow work in our close interpersonal relationships. But through the synchronistic field, we tend to get a bit more triggered in those close relationships. Why? So we can bring up the wounding to the surface, ultimately, hopefully, to transmute it. And then, of course, deepening the relationship. That's the positive expression. The negative is we trigger each other over and over again and it devolves into a psychodrama. Meanwhile, we have the planet Pluto, archetypally known as the god of hell, the planet that rules Scorpio, in a very tight square aspect to Mercury. Mercury represents our mind, our head, our intelligence, our thoughts, our perceptions. So we need to go, and the evolutionary intention here is to go into the hellish depths of our mind and try to mine some of those lower octave, low consciousness thought, habitual thought patterns that run on repeat every single day. And then work towards uh, becoming uh, more conscious about those, okay, and work towards having more positive. So you're trying to create 
um, more of a heaven in your mind instead of a hell. So obviously those are kind of charged symbols there, Venus and Scorpio, Pluto and uh, square Mercury. The storm is getting stronger. And for this full moon, the moon represents our heart and our soul and our emotional world. And it's in a water sign of Pisces. The moon loves being in water signs. And water signs themselves are connected to the subjective, to our feelings. So we're feeling very strongly. Not only that, but the moon is opposite the sun. During every single full moon, people tend to be, on average, a little bit more reactive. Okay. So our emotional bodies, our astral bodies, if, if you will, are stronger, are lit up. Okay. So we're feeling more strongly. So we get triggered easily. So you want to be aware of that. The storm is getting stronger. So we turn the volume up to maximum on people's capacity to feel. Why? So that we can be more internal, we can be more reflective, more contemplative, and live our life through our emotions in a more positive way, and explore consciousness, and go within. These are all very watery emotional words, okay, which is, is a really positive evolutionary intention here, but more specifically in a Piscean way, and this is very strong right now because the full moon's in Pisces, but also we have Neptune in a conjunction with this full moon also in Pisces. And uh, Neptune's been in Pisces since 2012. We still have three or four years of life left in this transit. Whenever a planet's in its own sign, it's at supercharged energy. So we've been experiencing somewhat of, I guess you could say, a spiritual renaissance in the sense of during this, uh, what, 13 or 14 year transit of Neptune in its own sign, we've been um, spiritually evolving. Consciousness has been raising within the collective. That's the evolutionary intention of this. And Neptune represents psychic sensitivity. Very strong full moon in a water sign, emotional sensitivity. So emotional sensitivity and psychic sensitivity are, are maximized right now. The veils between dimensions are thinner. Some of you are feeling this more than others. If you have 10 planets in Capricorn, an Earth sign in your birth chart, okay, the shadow side of that sort of dynamic, if you fall into that trap, is to lose touch with your emotions, to harden the heart. So if you have 10 planets in Capricorn and you have a weaker response to it, you may not, you'll, you'll be feeling like a rock effectively and you probably won't feel this, this energy. But for a lot of us, for most of us, especially those who have a lot of water in our charts or a strong Neptune in our charts, we're feeling this. And there's a lot of pain and suffering on the planet right now, a lot of fear consciousness. And if uh, maximized emotional and heightened psychic sensitivity is at a fever pitch, and we're psychically attuned to all the fear, all the hurt, all the grief, all the anger, all the rage on the world, that can be potentially overwhelming. So that's a challenge of this event. Okay. So how do we deal with that? And how do we not deal with that? Well, how we not deal with that is to become overwhelmed by our own level of sensitivity as we accrue more and more of other people's psychic pain. And then we get to this place where we don't want to feel so strongly and we begin to numb ourselves. And people with strong Pisces energy in their chart, they are playing for high stakes in this lifetime. They said as a soul coming in, is it spirit or spirits? You know, am I going to check out a reality? Am I going to suffer from addiction? because I feel so intensely, or am I going to develop more positive, life-affirming practices in my life to help heal from that accrued psychic pain and in turn raise my consciousness? So we want to be very aware of checking out of reality right now. Be very aware of taking too many bong rips. You know, is it a good idea to Netflix binge? You know, sometimes in moderation, although binging isn't really moderate. Or uh, binging on uh, YouTube astrology videos? You know, I hope so. Yeah, <laughs> obviously not. Or addicted to attachments in relationships or addicted to, by being a workaholic or it's anything pleasurable and repeatable. Being drunk on our cell phones, for example, 
to where we, we don't feel so intensely. And, and on, in general, everybody's feeling more intensely right now. So that's the draw. Okay, those vices. Be very aware of those vices now. And instead, what is that Neptunian goal? To expand our consciousness. Wherever Neptune is in your birth chart represents the focal point of your spiritual evolution. So it is ultimately about spiritually evolving. And I said, is it spirit or spirits? So meditation is one of the more powerful practices you can do right now. As you tap into this visionary energy of Pisces and try to, in meditative states, visualize a better future for yourself and for others. So in painting this picture, we've gone through the descriptive form of astrology. Here's what's happening astrologically. Why? Here's the evolutionary intention. And then we focus on the prescriptive with through evolutionary astrology. This is how we work with it. Through meditation, through introspection, contemplation, surrender, surrender to the divine plan, cultivating a certain level of detachment so that we don't get emotionally reactive and our wounds come to the surface. And we start having some, you know, manifesting some of those inner hells within us, which are low consciousness emotions, which are our stress responses. They damage ourselves and they damage other people because with the fourth dimension and the world of emotion, uh, the duality is still at work there, but it's attraction and repulsion. So where our attention goes, energy flows. So if we're angry, we just create more anger in our life or whatever the emotion is. Ditto for the high consciousness emotions like peace and love and compassion. That's why it's important to approach this lunation cycle Gandhi style, you know. He was at a very high level of consciousness. I think like 720 or 740 on the scale of consciousness from 0 to 1000. And that's why he was able to create such great change in India because he was coming from that evolved place. If he was coming from fear or anger, could he have caused any change? No, he would have made things worse, you know, because he would have just created more of that. So we approach this Gandhi style saying, I'm going to raise my consciousness. Now, Gandhi wasn't a Pisces, but he was very Piscean in the sense of he was a Libra son, but his son was in the 12th house, which has a lot of overlap in meaning with the 12th sign of Pisces. His son was also in an opposition with Neptune. Neptune rules Pisces, Neptune rules the 12th house. So these family of archetypes aren't completely interchangeable, but there's a lot of overlap in meaning. So he's a useful example here because he was very Piscean. And here he was a Libra. He had son in Libra. He had the identity of the peacemaker. That's one lofty, more virtuous expression of Libra. So he had the identity of the peacemaker in his 12th house. Uh, the, the son was in the 12th house, the house of consciousness, the house of meditative states. So um, he had an approach that was very useful. And there's some correlates with what he was experiencing and what we're experiencing now, at least through the Uranian lens, you know, restriction versus freedom. He was living in that. And he was in a time of Uranus, which is to say rule breaking, which is to say uh, rebellion. Okay. But he did it Gandhi style, coming from a high level of 740 consciousness, creating more 740 consciousness in everybody around him. Okay. So here we are in this Uranus, freedom-seeking energy. And the walls are closing in, that's dark side Saturn. What do we do? Well, we don't start throwing elbows, you know. We come Gandhi style, which is nonviolent disobedience. Nonviolent resistance. That's what Gandhi taught. You know, and that's, the, that's, that's a good way to approach uh, what we're going through now. And just by existing from this higher place and focusing on our meditation and focusing on our healing journey and recognizing what's going on out there and refusing to get caught up in the craziness of it all. This is, this is a, a way that you can navigate these uh, very trying times and in so doing accelerate your growth processes of an individual, which I believe that's why we're here. And I say meditation is very powerful now. As many of you know, I do guided meditations on this channel. So I'm going to do a meditation, which I think I've done on this channel before, 
Uh, but it's so apropos to the evolutionary intention here, so I'm going to share it with you again. It's about cultivating more peace, peace within ourselves, but also world peace. And it's been scientifically proven that when groups of people, here we have this very special star tribe here, um, when we have groups of people coming together in meditative states with a shared intention, it has profound effect on the lives of many, many people. So we do this meditation together and we help not only ourselves, not only ourselves, but other folks because we're coming from this place of love, of light, of, of raising people up, Gandhi style. So those are the core evolutionary intentions with the goal being to expand our consciousness. Sit in a nice, comfortable position with a straight spine and simply begin inhaling deep, deep into your belly and then exhaling from your belly. Breathe in, breathe out. Nice, slow, rhythmic breathing. Getting into the natural rhythms of the body. Bringing your conscious awareness into the core center of your body through the breath. Entering into the silence through the breath. Even breaths. About four or six seconds per inhale and four or six seconds per exhale. No pause between the in-breath and the out-breath. Natural breathing. Tapping into the natural rhythms of life. Now bring your awareness to your stomach area and just feel like you're in your stomach, focusing all your awareness in that area. And just feeling your stomach expand as you inhale and contract as you exhale. and begin to visualize a sky blue nebula in your stomach. And visualize this color with as much clarity and attention as you can. And you begin to notice that the nebula grows brighter and brighter with every inhale. become stronger, more luminescent with every breath. You can even begin to feel the energy in your stomach if you concentrate hard enough. And the sky blue color shines out in every direction. You see it grow brighter as you inhale, and as you exhale, feel all the stress leave your body. Now bring your awareness to your chest center, and visualize a white rose pinkish color in and around your chest beautiful pink nebula in your entire chest cavity. Feel all your emotions begin to soften. You become calmer. And you see this pink color grow brighter and brighter with every inhale. take this moment to feel feelings of self-love and compassion. 
for yourself in this journey, this incarnation. Recognize how far you've come and how well you're doing. And take a moment to honor the fact that you're a soul incarnate. Wow. Move your attention up to your head center now. And visualize a white gold nebula in and around your head. And the brighter the color becomes, the softer your thoughts and intentions are. And the more deeply you connect yourself to your creative potential. It brighter as you inhale, and the gold color ripples out in all directions as you exhale. And now let's tap into this Taurus energy within you. Visualize yourself sitting near a meadow on a beautiful spring afternoon. And imagine your hands are holding a small swallow and allow it to take flight. Watch it as it flutters over the meadow and settles on a branch of an apple tree covered with delicate young blossoms. See in the distance against the deep blue sky a large ivory white eagle soar through the air. The eagle dips and rises with just a tip of his wings. He's riding on the air currents. Now study the rich meadow before you. Many are the smells re-emerging after a long winter. The thawing ground is moist and the air is still cool. And see a cow grazing down near the pond as she enjoys the new grass after eating dry hay all winter. What color is this cow? Brown and white? Black, maybe? You decide. You can trace a small brook flowing out of the pond. Dragonflies dart about the rain-swollen stream. What a lovely, calming sound running water makes. Up on the far side of the pond is a flock of sheep and lamb. Count them. How many do you see? A shepherd watches over his flock. He is leaning on a crook, enjoying the warm sun as his sheepdog sits beside him. You can hear the bells of the sheep ring as they move through the grass. The baby lambs are skipping and playing with each other. Now stroll into this meadow Notice the yellow daffodils are scattered here and there. Move where you wish. Your swallow is flying about and lands near the pond. The eagle soars overhead and the sheep startle slightly as they see you approach. Notice how the soft ground sinks in as you take each step. 
feel the moisture soak into your shoes. The air is damp and fresh. The cow stares at you for a second and then continues to eat. Go up to her and feel her soft coat. She really likes it when you scratch her behind the ears. You see serenity and harmony everywhere as you look over your meadow. This is a center of calm and peace which you can visit and take solace any time you wish. And wish harmony and peace of this meadow to spread all over earth in the material plane. Now leave your meadow and return to body-centered awareness. and begin to expand your consciousness in every direction out from where you're sitting now. And it passes out of the building that you're in, above the trees, like a growing bubble, until you can see the town in which you live. A lovely rose light pours out from your heart blanketing first your neighbor's home and then the whole neighborhood and finally the entire town. You feel joy. You continue to expand to the point where you can see the entire nation. Perhaps there's trouble in some parts of it. Your heart continues to pour out love for all. Your whole country is now covered in this pink light. Next, spread your awareness to encompass first the cloud cover and then the atmosphere. And now you can see the whole planet. A gorgeous paradise of deep blue oceans, vast mountain ranges, and lush plains. But you know there is fighting in various parts of the world. Great unhappiness. And you want to help. From your vantage point, there are no borders marked, no separation, it's one world. All trouble is born out of ignorance and misunderstanding. We want to love one another and live in peace. Now from your heart, see a river of rose light which floods the entire globe with peace and love. You begin to see millions of smiling faces bathed in the rose light. You see men laying down their arms and embracing one another in common brotherhood. You see people giving food and clothes to others in need. Everybody begins to feel peace. Now see the planet move towards you and nestle in your heart. Moments ago, you were on the planet and now it's in you. 
keep the planet in your heart. Now spread your awareness throughout your entire body. Feel every cell in your body fuse with these lights that you visualized. And bring in the luminosity, the glow. And begin to bring your awareness back to the room. You can begin to move your fingers and toes, and whenever you're ready, open your eyes. <laughs>